Okay, so the forest is super haunted, but it only ever seems to hurt people who put others in harm's way. I guess it's at least a moral hazard. On March 28th, a large shipping vessel navigating the rivers around Baltimore crashed into a support pylon on the Francis Scott Key Bridge, resulting in a dramatic collapse. This event has prompted many to voice concerns about the safety of public infrastructure, despite the fact that the bridge had been recently inspected and found to be in good condition, and it's pretty unreasonable to expect any bridge to survive a direct impact from a 100,000-ton ship. Author and media critic Bajan Steven responded to the outpouring of, if not baseless, unrelated bridge anxiety, saying, safety is a feeling, and it's hard to engender a feeling with facts. That idea has been bouncing around in my head for weeks now. Many experts in fields of risk analysis and security think more or less the same way. System resilience researcher Jean Rocheland wrote, Safety does not exist out there, independent of our minds and culture, ready to be measured, but is a constructed human concept, more easily judged than defined. As with most constructed concepts, that doesn't mean safety doesn't exist, but it contains a critical subjective element that can be extremely hard to measure or control. As an engineer and an anxious person by nature, I'm uncomfortably aware of how the dangers that capture our imagination and attention, the things that make us feel unsafe, often have little or nothing to do with the stuff that poses the greatest threat. Disasters aren't usually caused by giant boat crashes, but small things that most people would find beneath consideration, the minimum temperature rating of an O-ring, the maintenance schedule of a piece of equipment, the placement of an emergency stop button. These sorts of details seem inconsequential until they kill a project, a company, or thousands of people when treated with inadequate care. It's depressingly easy to steer our attention away from those critical details and toward big, exciting threats, no matter how little we might gain from worrying about them, or if they're even possible. What if I get attacked by a shark while I'm out swimming? Are satanic cults indoctrinating my child through Dungeons and Dragons? Where will I get ammunition during the zombie outbreak? Without some way to tether that sort of anxious speculation to reality, we inevitably turn toward the sensational, which is, almost by definition, the least likely to be a problem. Worse yet, if those fantasies shape our behavior, we'll end up burning resources more or less at random as we try to run from whatever pops into our heads, or whatever con artists can plant there to sell you 5G cognition enlargement pills. The feeling of safety is malleable, and without some sort of grounding in the real world, it can be hammered into whatever shape is convenient. Many organizations try to encourage that sort of grounding through risk management, a set of practices designed to give a sense of perspective and purpose to our anxieties. You already know what risk is, but it has a very particular definition in risk management. Risk is an interaction with a hazard that creates uncertainty in the achievement of goals. I'm pulling from a couple different sources for that, so let me unpack it a bit. A hazard is a potential cause of disruption, an uncontrolled input that can lead to dangerously unpredictable outcomes. Hazards can be physical, like a crater full of lava, or abstract, like a set of poorly phrased instructions, or even personal, like an intrusive traumatic memory. So long as nothing interacts with them, they're fine. A volcano on Mars isn't anything that you need to worry about. But when we do interact with hazards, their potential is released in a way that increases uncertainty that we can do whatever we set out to do. We're thinking about everything here in terms of probability. Your tires won't necessarily pop if you bike over broken glass. You might get lucky. But each time you do, you're rolling the dice and giving that hazard another shot at ruining your day. Now, if you're used to thinking about risk in terms of avoiding danger, it might be surprising that our definition seems more focused on pursuing goals. Staying alive and unharmed are certainly laudable goals, but risk management only makes sense if it's embedded in a context of doing stuff. In order to have any plans beyond don't get hurt, you can't just run away from every hazard and congratulate yourself for a job well done. You have to control and account for the risk they introduce. Never using your kitchen knife will, technically, minimize your risk of cutting yourself, but it does kind of defeat the purpose of having one. This agency-oriented framing gracefully sidesteps questions like how prepared is prepared enough by asking a pair of questions in return. Well, what do you want to do, and what are you willing to gamble to do it? 
Now that we've defined risk, we can ask how we might go about managing it. You might recall our discussion of Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, or FMEA, a rubric that risk-averse organizations use to rank which failure scenarios deserve the most attention by evaluating a combination of their likelihood, severity, and detectability in a single number. If you're in a hurry, you could also use a simple risk assessment, which prioritizes potential risks by just the sum of their frequency and severity. Both might sound like worrying with a spreadsheet and some extra steps, but these sorts of analysis can sometimes be surprising, alerting us that our intuitions are misaligned with the biggest risks. You might not have realized just how common a deadly car accident is compared to a bridge collapse, or how much work goes into inspecting bridges every few months. But staring down those numbers has the potential to redirect your attention to closer fires. Once you've identified the most pressing risks, you can develop controls for them, measures that will either eliminate hazards or reduce the likelihood that they'll interfere with your plans. In descending order of efficacy, risk controls can be classified as direct, that is, eliminating or mitigating the threat posed by a hazard, physical, like barriers or signs to prevent people from interacting with it, or educational, as in training that helps people approach the hazard safely. Imagine you have a goal of planting a few trees, and your FMEA highlights a nearby cliff as a source of risk. It's easy to imagine someone losing their balance while hauling a sack of dirt and not getting to finish the project. If you had a bulldozer and a few years to prepare, turning that cliff into a gentle slope would probably be the most effective way to mitigate any risk, but also very costly. Putting up a guardrail or warning signs might be enough to reduce the risk to acceptable levels, or maybe even telling people to stay away from the edge. The controls you ultimately decide to implement will depend on the resources you have and how much risk you're willing to tolerate to get things done. Yes, technically, you could just attack the cliff with a shovel, but you're just as likely to finish the project as you would be if you tumbled over the edge. Risk controls can be costly and time-consuming to implement, so if you decide a hazard deserves that sort of attention, it's worth coming up with a few different ideas in each category and gaming out how they'll work in practice. Who will be taking on the additional workload of building, operating, validating, and maintaining those controls? And for how long? It's also worth continually testing and evaluating the efficacy of those measures once they're in place. No plan survives first contact with the enemy, and it's unlikely that the first risk controls implemented will continue to work flawlessly forever. We can now go back to the top of the process and repeat analyzing and reducing or eliminating sources of risk until we've achieved some likelihood of success that's worth gambling on. Of course, there's always going to be some risk remaining. Life is an uncertain thing, and feeling unsafe is really just a function of not knowing what might happen or what to do about it. But rather than wringing our hands fruitlessly, we can now engage directly with those questions. What might happen? Research and rank the biggest sources of uncertainty. What to do about it? find ways to control the ones that are too hairy for us to accept, and finally, decide one way or the other whether our goals are worth chancing what's left. That's really what risk management is for, transforming scatterbrained anxiety into an informed choice. It's hard to engender a feeling with facts, but if you're open to it and you have a process, it's not impossible. What sort of scary goals do you have that you think could benefit from a sort of risk management process? Do you feel any better about accepting the risks involved by making that choice deliberately? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah blah subscribe blah share, and don't stop thinking.